not to turn it off when it looks like that, but yeah, it definitely can. I, I hear there's something called alarm fatigue, and I imagine somebody in your position would probably know that very well. Um, so, so I guess I'll start with the the first question I asked Amanda. What's your degree in, if you have one? Yeah, so I actually started my degree um, also at the University of Utah in geology, and I got all the way to student teaching. Um, I started at Granite School District to start my student teaching in earth science education. So I got my geology degree, earth science education, passed that praxis test, um, and then went to student teach. And we ended up having a child during that time. And I realized, unfortunately, Utah teachers don't make very much money. And so I started looking for a new job. <laughs> so, so you were going to teach earth science. You were a rock dude. How did you end up in the server room? So I actually had another uh, job for four years in between in cells. And part of what I did during cells was I moved more towards a sales engineer role. So I worked with a lot of the people who were on the tech side and my entire time at the University of Utah, I worked in entry level IT roles. And so it just seemed like I kept coming back to IT over and over and over again. And so once I decided I couldn't handle sales anymore, I decided I actually did enjoy IT and tried to make it back into that world. So you made it back into IT then. That seems like a, a hop, skip and a jump away from security. But how did you end up making that transition? I kind of already had an introduction into the security world. Uh, my family, my dad and his brother had started a digital forensics company in Utah. Um, and so while I was going to college and, and growing up, I kind of watched them build that company um, and was introduced into some of those areas. Uh, and I kept I always wanted to go back and do that. I just never really thought I was smart enough until I went back to college and realized, hey, none of us are smart. I could totally do this. And so I wanted to go into digital forensics. So I started to get into the security world. And then I realized there's so much more than forensics. It's not just forensics. There's a whole different, there's so many different areas you can go into. What part of it do you like most then? That keeps you in the job. Like I had mentioned before, I'm, I'm kind of on what you would call the blue team. Uh, and so you have like the red team with the penetration testing and uh, hackers, I guess you would say. Uh, and I'm more on the defense side. I like that more. Um, it might just be because most of my friends have moved into this world. So I know a lot of people who do it. We can share a lot of stories. Uh, it's just something that I enjoy doing. It was interesting to me, I guess. <laughs> And it pays better than teaching about earth science in Utah. I won't even tell you how much. I don't want to make people sad. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if you get nothing else from this episode today, everybody, please, let's all pay our teachers more in the United States. Just let's exactly. just all agree that that should just be a thing. But we're glad that that forced you to come to us, though, because we, we really appreciate having you as part of the team. And, and I know you were invited on because you are. And, and that brings me to another valued member of the team that we wanted to feature today, Josh Randall. Hey, Josh. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So um, so I guess we'll start the same with you then. Uh, your name, your position, and whether or not you have a degree and what it's in. Definitely. Uh, my name is Joshua Randall. Um, I'm a cybersecurity engineer. I'm actually on the architecture team here. So we... Um, to make sure uh, systems are designed with security in mind, uh, run uh, tests on them and audits on them to ensure that they do have the patching and they're compliant with what our goals are um, with her. And my degree is actually in history that I got a long time ago from the University of Northern Colorado. History. Now that's a fluffy liberal arts degree. How did you end up in something so technical, sir? That is a long story. I'll keep it short, though. <laughs> oh, oh, right there. Uh, in a nutshell, um, you know, I, I went to college. I loved history, so I took my history degree. And when I graduated, um, it didn't take me long to realize the opportunities uh, com that come with a history degree are few and far between. So 
Um, I did end up uh, starting working in retail. Um, originally, it was just a, a, a job afterwards, um, but I did like it, uh, especially logistics and systems. I, I was enjoying that part of it. So I uh, worked my way up and I was uh, in store management and a major retail retailer. Uh, I would run teams, five to 50 people or th- things like that. I met my wife there and we have four amazing kids now. Um, with there. But a um, couple years back, there was an incident that kind of affected our lives, uh, probably everybody's life with COVID um, coming. And all our kids had to be taught from home. And both me and my wife worked in retail. And so we had to sit down and figure out who was going to stay home with the kids. Um, and my wife said, I think it's time for you to uh, go after your passion. So with her support, I was able to uh, uh, leave retail and I started uh, educating myself and taking some classes in tech um, while helping the kids do uh, school learning as well. Um, oh, that. so you went back to school the same time you were helping the kiddos stay in school. Yes, that was that was fun. Um, our, uh, <laughs> we had a kindergartner doing e-learning at the time, oh. uh, which uh, having a kindergartner focus on a screen for hours a day oh, is uh, very hard. I can't get my gremlin uh, to do it right before bedtime as a treat. I and he's three, so I guess like that's that's like another three years. But attention, holy cow! How do you get homework done? Oh, uh, mine was generally late at night afterwards. Uh, I quickly realized that I had to do mine uh, after uh, after they were in bed <laughs> to make sure that everything got in. But yeah, um, a little after uh, I took a, a boot camp actually course. So it's where you partnered with a, a university here um, and did some deep dive into tech. Um, worked really well to to get me freshened up on some tech stuff and uh, landed my first tech support role um, at a company uh, working with uh, ArcSight um, Sim um, right there, which is a, just a, another co- a company there. And then I, um, a few months into there, I was working with Linux a lot, which was a great intro to there. But then Avanti reached out for tech support for me. So then I jumped in with Avanti. And then how did you make the move then? Because Avanti recruited you for tech support and you got an internal promotion transition to the security team. So how did that come about? Yeah. Well, while I was in tech support, I, I continued to educate myself. I got um, my first certification. So my security plus um, there. Uh, and then honestly, just one, uh, I was looking around um LinkedIn, and I saw there was a cybersecurity position open uh, with Avanti, and I put my hat in. Um, I didn't really expect it to go far. Uh, there's always a running joke when you're looking for a cybersecurity job, intro position, five years experience required um, with there. But <laughs> so um, I put in, and what was great was in the interview, you know, I was uh, very honest, uh, lack of uh, you know, professional cybersecurity experience, but, you know, I got a passion to learn. Um, I got skills that can be beneficial and I can do it. Um, and they felt I would be a good fit for the team. So they brought me on and, uh, really respect them for that. So is it what you expected? Cybersecurity as a whole, uh, and Cameron kind of alluded to this is bigger than I realized, um, with their, um, I kind of came in knowing about, you know, pen testers or hackers, the red team and the blue team. Um, but once you get involved in it and you see that there's, uh, you know, architecture in there, there's uh, um, analysts going through there, there's auditors doing it, there's people doing, uh, worrying about governance and compliance and all sorts of things uh, and positions in there that pe- a lot of people don't know about. So um, it's a lot bigger and uh, even cooler than I realized. And a lot more opportunity to use other types of skills instead of just the elite hacker. Sorry, hashtag cool kid moment there. But but like it, it's not just like writing code that can do crazy things. It's it's other skills too, right? Yeah, definitely. Uh, some of the the things I learned in uh, you know working in retail management have come off great. Being able to communicate, uh, manage projects, 
Um, these kind of things that people will call soft skills, um, that you'll hear that term, they do wonders for you. Um, when you're working as a team and figuring things out, when I have to design a system for Cameron, um, to make sure he can use it correctly, um, you know, or, or help anybody out, uh, those kind of skills go a long way, um, in a career here. Cameron, then have you found that some of your previous career iterations or expectations and some of those skills that you had at previous expectations in your career, have they served you well in cyber in ways you weren't expecting? Yeah, I think it's a lot like Josh just said. Um, I never thought getting into cybersecurity that my sales job or my teaching job would <laughs> have any impact at all. Um, but that's, I mean, that cybersecurity is, it's always changing. There's different things that, I mean, we have to continue to learn and learn and learn. Um, and as you're learning this, you're going to be working with people where you have to, for when I was teaching, you have to be able to teach them why this happened, how it happened, what's going on. Um, and you, depending on what the incident is or the vulnerability or the actors that are coming after you, you have to pull in people from different departments. And it's not always the same people. It may be people who might not be as experienced in technology. And so just being able to work with anybody at any level, um, is really useful, especially because I've been there at the level where I didn't know what I was talking about to the level where I still don't know what I'm talking about, but at least I know a little bit more. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, there's so much that we do every single day that it's impossible to come into this job, not using skills that you've had previously. So Amanda, as somebody who is the big wig, one of them anyway, at Avanti, with that said, you are one of the people who is at the top of the ladder. You do see people and candidates and, and have a, an influence in building a team and the kind of skills you expect and the kind of culture and, and those kind of soft skill applications. What do you think cybersecurity needs more of? And what have you tried to build or have been excited to see built at Avanti's team? Frequently, it has been soft skills that I think every industry everywhere has been looking for. There was such a strong emphasis on specialization and know the most about one thing and that that would be your in. But, but anymore, there, there is an opportunity to learn many things about all kinds of different things. It can be a lot more about applying what you know. So I would echo with both what Joshua and Cameron said, that the biggest component of cybersecurity is a desire to learn, to continue learning. And, and on top of that, be curious. Have that be your motivator to continue learning because the skills that you need to be able to do this job, the hard skills are, are out there. They're available. You can learn them through boot camps. You can learn them through connections. You can learn them through Googling. Uh, I would be careful at some of the websites you might search for hacking, but 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 re what really matters is is being being curious and being wanting to learn. So how can and, and this will be the last question I think because um, because we're coming up on time here. But in your opinion, how can you best how can employers best identify the candidates who are willing and eager to learn? That is the golden question, isn't it? If I if I knew if I knew the yes to that, I would be doing something much different and being paid much more. <laughs> but but I I think I think our our CSO Daniel has done an incredible job with assembling a team of individuals from various backgrounds. It's become very clear from this conversation, right? I think he is focused much more on asking the practical questions that make people stop, think, assess, and then respond. So sometimes it's about you have to have the background knowledge, right? Even though you might be a history major, you still have to have progressed to the point where, where Joshua did become passion, you know, with IT and then ultimately over there. So you do have to have the technical background. But what, what you really need to be successful in this career is a, a, a critical thinking set. So when someone presents you with a problem or you're able to see a problem, which is even better, uh, you can stop, think and apply 
that that knowledge driven ambition, that curiosity that you have. Oh man, now I kind of want to apply because it sounds like fun. <laughs> Well, I think it is. I think it is. Yeah, <laughs> I would say that it is. Well, thank you, Amanda, Cameron, and Josh for joining us. Thank you, Chris, for lurking in the shadows for most of before this. We, before we wrap up, I came up with yeah. this great new joke. Oh, God. Based on today's episode. Oh, no. An accountant, a geologist, and a historian <laughs> walked into the South. <laughs> <laughs> that that is all the farther I got, but it sounds like the start of a really good show. We're gonna have to finish that one somehow. That's that's our that's our mission here. Oh, oh, Doesn't man, that sound great? That is. Yeah. That, I, oh man, I understand. That's <laughs> this podcast is recurring, right? So, Chris, yes. you have now committed yourself to finishing the yes. joke for next time. All right. All right. Fair yes. Enough. See, I, I'll see if I can pull that off. You made me go break into places at the conference. You can at least finish a silly joke. So, and with that tantalizing nugget for next time, thank everybody so much again for tuning in today. Thanks again to Amanda, Cameron, and Josh for joining us. Thank you, Chris, for contributing as well. Um, if you'd like to continue today's conversation, and we, I would be especially curious because I was not expecting any of those degrees from any three of you. How do you want to get into security? And what is your degree? Um, please follow us at Twitter at Go Ivanti, I V A N T I, and uh, links for today's materials and show notes will, of course, be on your podcasting platform of choice. So please feel free to peruse there. And as always, if you found our conversation amusing, interesting, or at least mildly entertaining, Please share this with your teammates and friends. The more you share and the more people who listen, the more the algorithm likes us as your token marketer, I must remind. But, and with that, we're signing off for this episode. Stay safe, everybody. We'll talk soon. Bye. Bye.